In this lesson, we're going to be looking at the evidence for evolution, specifically, you know, how do we, how do we know this? How do we come to understand this? What is the, what is all this evidence that supports this idea of evolution? <clears throat> One, of course, being fossils, and you can see here some numerous fossils of an organism called a trilobite. Very, very abundant, common in the fossil record, but of course no longer on the planet today. So we're going to be looking at things like fossils here. So starting um, with fossils, again our friend the trilobite. Fossils, by definition, are the preserved remains of once living organisms. So it's some kind of remnant from an organism that was once alive and is no longer alive. In most cases, they are formed in rock and are actually made of rock. A lot of people don't realize that fossils are rocks, but they are. Most of them are. The way that um, the fossils that form in rock are created is that the organism is first buried in sediment, sand, mud, something like that. The hard parts of the organism mineralize, that is, they become minerals. They become a rock, basically. And the softer parts of the organism decay and go away. And then the surrounding sediment becomes rock. It hardens and forms a rock. So that would be the case in the case of this trilobite. And then this is what's called an imprint fossil. This is what was left of a fish, as you can see. And then this is some kind of a algae. So you can see in each case, it's a rock now, but it leaves some kind of a trace, a remnant of the once living organism. In some cases, the actual organism is preserved either in ice, in something called tar, um, asphalt, uh, in California, they have these tar pits and everything. We can talk more about that later, but um, the other example here is amber. This is fossilized tree sap, and sometimes bugs or seeds or leaves or sticks would get caught in the tree sap and then fossilize, and that's an example of another kind of fossil. Now, one of the things we know about fossils is their age, and we know this by dating them. And there's two kinds of dating. There's absolute dating and relative dating. In absolute dating, we actually use an estimation of the age of a fossil or the age of a rock using rates, known rates of radioactive decay. So we know how long it takes for these certain elements to decay. We measure how much is left in the rock, and then we can tell kind of how long it's been decaying. This only works for certain uh, ages, though. Sometimes you get to be too old, it's difficult to date them radioactively. We also look at relative dating. And in this case, you're looking at the position of the fossil in the sedimentary layer. So further down, it's going to be older because, of course, the sediments have been laid on top of each other. So you dig down or you look at exposed layers, and the ones that are down further um, are older, and the ones that are higher up are, are newer. So what can we tell from a fossil? Fossil records document the way life has changed through time. So over time, we can look and see that we started with single cells, and then gradually it became more complex animals and plants. At some point we saw dinosaurs, um, birds, and then finally man. So just by looking at the ages of fossils and what kinds of fossils we're finding, we can tell how the Earth has changed. We can also look at how individual organisms or groups of organisms have changed over time. One example is a horse. Here's the modern-day horse, um, and here's the bone structure of its leg. It has a single toe coming down. It's walking basically on one toe, which is kind of strange to think of. But its ancient relative, the most ancient horse that we, that we find that's a relative of the horse is the Hyracotherium. And Hyracotherium had four toes. Actually, I think it had five. I'm only seeing four there, but I think, I'm pretty sure it had five toes. More like a dog's foot. Um, and so you can see that over time, uh, the horse, as it evolved over long periods of time, ended up with three toes here, and then a single toe here, and then finally the modern day horse. It also grew larger, as you can see. We can tell from the fossils that it started out as a very small animal, like a small dog, maybe like a terrier, and then it grew larger. And of course, all of this is due to changing um, habitats, changing environments. Um, but by looking at the fossils, we can see how organisms have changed. Also, fossils give us an idea of transitions that have happened in evolution, and we have already talked about Archaeopteryx, um, first found in 1859. So here's the fossil Archaeopteryx, and this is what we think it looked like. Notice it has teeth and feathers, which is very unusual. And then more recently, the Tiktaalik. Tiktaalik was a, sort of a transitional fossil between what we know as the lobe fin fish, like the coelacanth, 
and the early tetrapods, which came out onto land that had actually legs that it walked on. And in between them, there was kind of this missing piece. And then in 2006, they found it, and it was Tiktaalik. And you can see that it has some characteristics of this lobe fin fish and some characteristics of the early tetrapods. This is what they think it might have looked like. It's kind of cute, I think. We have other kinds of evidence besides fossils for evolution. One is homologous structures, homologous meaning the same. Um, homologous structures are structures with unique functions. And so if we look at the bones of the four, in the forelimb of mammals, we see um, similar structures actually inside. So the frog has a humerus bone, which is your upper arm bone. A horse has a humerus. A lion has a humerus. Here's a human humerus. A bat even has one, and a whale has one. And we can continue on and look at the different bones. We can say that here's the radius and ulna. Here the frog also has a radius and ulna, although it's kind of hard to see the ulna. The horse has a radius and an ulna. Actually, I think I did that wrong. I think here's the radius and ulna here. I'm not sure now about the horse anatomy. But here's the radius and ulna, and here's the radius and ulna, and here's the radius and ulna in a bat. So we look at these, these organisms that are all very different, the limb is doing something different in a whale and a frog and a bat and a human, but they all have the same internal structure and that shows that they're related and it gives you some idea about evolutionary history. Another um, kind of evidence for evolution is in what we call analogous structures. Analogous structures are structures that have a common function in organisms that aren't related. So it's kind of the opposite of um, homologous structures. Analogous structures are structures that even though those organisms are very different, they look the same and presumably because they evolved for a particular environment. This is a case of what we call convergent evolution, where the structure um, is a similar solution to a problem or a similar reaction to an environment. One example of this is the wings that we see in all such as birds, bats, insects, and plants. So if we look at um, this set of images, we can see a similar solution for all of these organisms in, in terms of trying to fly. Okay, so we see a similar, we see a similar structure in bird's wing. Um, this is the wing of a pterosaur, which is a reptile. Um, this is the wing of a bat. We also have butterfly wings that are similar. And then finally, these are seeds. They're called um, samara, which are maple seeds. and uh, the wings actually help the seeds to fly and, and disperse so they can go and grow. Um, so you see a similar kind of pattern, even though these are obviously very um, unrelated species. That's analogous structures is what that's called. Here are some more examples of analogous structures or analogous organisms. These are all marsupial mammals, which are um, a type of mammal that lives pretty much exclusively on the continent of Australia. And, um, of course, they give birth to young that are fairly undeveloped, and they grow in a pouch. You've probably heard of these. Then we have eutherian mammals, which are mammals that give birth to young that are um, grown inside the uterus completely until they're ready to be born, and they are nourished by a placenta. <clears throat> so we see similar organisms, even though they're, they're distantly related because they're not the same type of mammal, but in similar environments. So there's a, a mole in um, that you're probably familiar with, and then there's a marsupial mole. Then we have the flying squirrel and the sugar glider, which both almost look the same. We have a wombat, and then we have a woodchuck. We have a wolverine, you're probably familiar with wolverines, and then the Tasmanian devil looks almost the same. Has the same habitat, same behaviors, all of that. And then of course we have the kangaroo and the cavey. Another piece of evidence that we have for evolution has to do with embryos, and this you may not be familiar with this, I don't know if you are, but we're going to learn about it. Um, the em embryos of many different organisms actually share common characteristics, and scientists say that um, it's, it's when you look at the embryo, you're looking sort of back through time, that you're seeing um, changes that have occurred within that organism over the course of time. So you see remnants from things that maybe were part of that organism's past. For instance, we can look in human embryos, and at some point in development, you see what look like gills. Here's a very early human embryo, and you can see sort of gill slits. Um, you also see a tail in a human embryo. 
and um, you see that each embryo looks very similar. They all have gill slits. They all have tails, no matter what it's going to become, a human, a chicken, a snake, a salamander, or a fish. So here's kind of an overview. Here in this column, we have a fish, a salamander, a turtle, a tortoise, a chick, a pig, a calf, a rabbit, and finally a human. Now, when we get down to the later development, you can begin to see that they are not the same. But in the earliest stages of development, you almost cannot tell the difference between these embryos. What that tells you is that these or all of these organisms are related by some common heritage. It's evidence that they evolved. Another important evidence for evolution is the existence of these things called vestigial structures. These are structures that have no apparent function but resemble structures perhaps their ancestors possessed, and it's a, it's a clue to evolutionary history. Um, one example would be this whale, although it has no legs, no back legs, it actually has pelvis bones. So these are bones of what used to be a pelvis. A pelvis is only for attaching legs. So that's the only reason you have a pelvis is to attach your legs um, to your spine. So why would, it, why would a whale need a pelvis? And then this little piece here is actually a femur bone, a lower leg bone that's um, greatly reduced in size. But why, why does the whale have this femur bone? Well, presumably it's because whales once lived on land and had legs. So we'll talk more about that in class. Here are a couple of other examples. Humans, we have tail bones. Okay, we don't have tails, but we have a tail bone, which is vestigial, left over. And then we also have muscles for wiggling our ears, which we don't move our ears around, but we still have some of those same mus those muscles. We don't have a reason to move our ears, but the muscles are there. Um, also, we talked about whales having hip bones. Snakes also have hip bones, and some snakes actually have tiny little hind legs still left over, even though they don't use them to walk. Here's an actual photograph here of the tiny little back legs of some snakes. And then, of course, the pelvis here. Those are vestigial. That means they're not using them. They're not good for anything in those organisms, but presumably they're left, at, left over from a time when that organism actually did have legs in its evolutionary history. All right, last bit of evidence. I know this is going a little bit long. Last bit of evidence has to do with biochemistry, and this is more recent. Um, we can look at DNA and proteins of... Um, <clears throat> different organisms and understand the relatedness and it can give you a clue to their evolutionary past. So we see similarity in DNA and protein structures of different organisms. Here's an example. You might see a string of DNA here in a hippopotamus and here in a humpback whale. And the fact that they're almost identical tells you that these organisms are somewhat related, that there's some connection that they have in their evolutionary past. Here's another example. In this case, you're looking at the string of amino acids in human hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is the um, molecule in your blood, the protein in your blood that carries the oxygen. And so it's, it's pretty common in a lot of organisms. And here we're comparing this lamprey, which looks kind of creepy, but it's a fish, um, a frog, a chicken, a mouse, a monkey, and a human. And you can see the number of differences in the string of amino acids in hemoglobin. In a lamprey, there's a lot of difference, 125 differences, so we're not very closely related to a lamprey. But when you get down to the monkey, there's only eight differences between the monkey hemoglobin and the human hemoglobin. That's pretty closely related. So that tells us that in our evolutionary history, we were, um, we had some connection to monkeys. So anyhow, that's the evidence for evolution, and I'm sorry it went a little bit long. Um, but that's it for this one.